So what is worship? Why do we do what we do? What comes to mind when you hear the word worship? Singing. Singing. Reverence. Reverence. Prayer. Okay. Praise. Prayer, praise. Gratitude. Gratitude. Being together. Being together. Reading scripture. Reading scripture. What was that? Listening to sermons. Listening to sermons. Connection with spirituality. Connection with spirituality. Living the Bible. Living the Bible. Is there an object of worship or in worship? Connection and God. Yeah. So, some traditional ways of kind of understanding, thinking about worship is to praise God or as a response to God, to create community, transformation, both of ourselves and of the world, to live faithfully or account- and have accountability, communicate the gospel to others, um, both communal and personal dimensions, and then formation, which what I mean by that is Christian formation or being formed in the image and likeness of Christ, to use a phrase from Paul's from Paul's epistles. Um, but worship is, you know, I think as my plan for today is to talk about some of the early uh, history of worship, what we know, uh, or what we think we know from the early tradition, um, and then do a little bit of theological reflection on what worship is, but interrupt at any time. There'll be time at the end for discussion. Um, I have some questions in the middle here, but if you have a question or want to offer a perspective, don't hesitate especially since we're sort of a small group, we'll have time for that. So, um, okay. Oh, and before I begin, I want to just say that this, uh, most of my, I, the, the resources I used for this presentation are from our book of worship. Did you all know that the UCC has a book of worship? Um, it's called just book of worship, not the book of worship. And there's no the there intentionally. It's um, a guide, a recommendation, a suggestion. We're not bound to it. But it has liturgies for all different types of things. And then um, three resources in particular. One called Early Christian Worship by Paul Bradshaw. And then two resources by a woman named Ruth Duck, who's a progressive Christian. She's a UCC pastor and musician. Um, Ruth Duck. And this one's called Finding Words for Worship. And the other one is called Worship for the Whole People of God. And so a lot of what I have, particularly the theological reflection stuff, comes from Ruth Duck. Okay. So one way to answer the question of why we do what we do is because it's what Jesus, Jesus did. Um, the evidence that we have from, primarily from the New Testaments is that uh, Jesus participated and honored um, in, as he was trying to reform <laughs> the three kind of primary ways that Jewish, Jewish communities worship, that our worship comes from its Jewish roots. And the first one is table fellowship. And this um, picture actually is by a German Catholic priest called Sieger Coder. I just loved this depiction of table fellowship. And all through the um, Gospels for sure, and then the New Testament tradition, uh, it shows how important that is gathering together around a table was, and that they considered that a part of our ability or our, uh, what we do as a worshiping community. Teaching in uh, the synagogue, so Torah in the synagogue, and the Jewish practice in the synagogue was a lot of teaching and talking about the Torah together, and arguing about its meaning, and ex- explicating it in a group, and definitely there's, we have all kinds of scriptures where Jesus would be teaching, both in buildings and also out in the fields. And then, of course, the temple, um, Jesus' reverence for the, I would say, his reverence for the temple and the role of the temple could be in the spiritual life of the people is, most, is best evidenced in his, uh, the story of him turning the tables over at the temple, that um, he was uh, not trying to demolish the temple, but to reform and to um, call the worshiping community to its, back to its roots about what the table fellowship, this teaching in the synagogue, and particularly the temple, which was the, the place of sacrifice, the place where the holiest of holies lived. Um, so we know that those things were important to him. Um, after the resurrection, 
Jesus's followers um, still participated in worship at the temple and in the synagogue, but the temple was destroyed, as we know, in 70 um, CE. And so the synagogue movement uh, came forth and with strength in the Jewish community. But as the Christian movement, as the Jesus followers began to talk about what it meant to be a Jesus follower, that caused rift with the um, Jewish leaders in the synagogue. And so it became harder and harder for the Jesus followers, the early Christians, to worship in the synagogue. So they began pretty much to have house church, to worship together in the house church. Um, And what we know about that early worship, we're really lucky, I would say, that we have a document called the Didache. Has anybody heard of that? So it was um, written in early part of the, or late part of the first century, um, and it was found in, I can't remember when it was found, but it's um, an ancient document that has a description about um, kind of what the early Christian communities were about. Um, It's anonymous, and it includes, um, it has kind of three parts, and the first part deals with Christian ethics. The second part deals with rituals such as baptism and the Eucharist. And interestingly, it talks about baptism by immersion. Um, And if immersion wasn't possible, then a fusion. And then it talks about church organization. The Lord's Prayer is included in full in that document. And fasting is ordered on Wednesdays and Fridays. And in terms of church uh, leadership, it talks about that itinerant apostles and prophets would serve as chief priests and celebrants of the Eucharist. So there wasn't a sense of clergy necessarily, but there were people who were set apart to be the teachers and the celebrants in those communities. So is this the first mention of house churches in the Well, we have house church mentioned. You could, you could extrapolate that from the New Testament writings, and those would be earlier, um, of people gathering together in people's homes. I mean, Paul talked about that, and, and uh, sharing a meal together, um, and we could assume that that would be what they would consider. They, would, they would, uh, wouldn't read scripture then, but they would tell the oral stories and probably gather in prayer, do what we think is similar to the Lord's Supper. I mean, all of that was developing, but this was written um, probably about this a little bit probably right about the time, same time that John's gospel was written. So we know that this type of format, this kind of structure, was with rituals, baptism, and, and communion were happening pretty early um, in the formation of the church. Um, so mostly the structure that would come through is that uh, the shape of worship, they would gather on Sundays, um, and the scholars aren't entirely sure why Sunday could be a reference to the three days Um, could be because the Jewish communities gathered on Saturday, and so they were trying to set themselves apart. There's lots of kind of speculation around that, but they gathered on Sundays. They read and interpreted scripture. They had prayers of the people, and then there was a dismissal, and then there was a Eucharistic meal, but the Eucharistic meal at the beginning happened in the evening on Sundays. It was separate from the morning uh, liturgy, and it would be like a table fellowship. It was a full-on meal, and at the beginning of it, um, let's see, come on, hmm, I wonder if my thing is running out of battery, there we go, oh yeah, so there's early Christian worship, at the beginning of the meal, the presider who, um, it, it talks about being a he, we could presume that it probably mostly was a he, but not, not only, the presider of the meal would take the bread in his hands, set a, say a short blessing, Um, break the bread, and share it with those present. And then they'd eat the meal and talk about whatever they talked about. And then at the end of the meal, they'd take the cup um, of wine in his hand, set a longer blessing, and share it around the table. So does this seem familiar? This this kind of uh, words of institution or the litany of what it is that happened? And so, you know, when we say that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, Um, probably Jesus wasn't, it wasn't like he was instituting a new practice and saying, do this practice, this wrestling of the bread and sharing it in remembrance of me. But as you gather and do what you normally do together in community, remember me. So I just think that's an interesting um, framing on that, that he was using what what Jewish communities did and and adding in this, this sense of remember me when you come together and do this. Okay, in the second century... We have writings from um, Justin Martyr, the earliest complete written outline um, 
of a Eucharistic service. And I'm actually going to read it to you. So I think it's, it's, so this is the second century. See if what, which of these things sound familiar to you. And on the day called Sunday, an assembly is held in one place of all who live in town or country. And the records of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read for as time allows. Then when the reader has finished, the president, in a discourse, admonishes and exhorts us to imitate these good things. What's, what's another word for that? Sermon, right. <laughs> then we all stand up together and send up prayers, and when we have finished praying, bread and wine and water are brought up, and the president likewise sends up prayers and thanksgiving to the best of his ability, and the people assent, saying the amen, and the elements over which thanks have been given are distributed, and everyone partakes. And they are sent through the deacons to those who are not present after the gathering. And the wealthy who so desire give what they wish as each chooses, and what is collected is deposited with the president. He helps orphans and widows, and those who through sickness or any cause are in need, and those in prison and strangers sojourning among us in word, he takes care of all of those who are in need. At the end of the gathering, they greet each other with a holy kiss. So what did you notice? Yeah. Water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in the Episcopal tradition that I grew up in, we would mix the water and the wine together. So I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Other things you noticed? The, the kiss of peace. Mm -hmm. the sharing the mm -hmm. peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, and the other piece is it's kind of hard to, to kind of notice this because it's so different than what we do. By this point, which is just the second century, so I don't know, 50 years or so since the Didache was written, the Eucharistic meal as an evening meal has completely disappeared and it's been integrated into the worship. And so we're not sure when or how or why that happened, but it's significant because, as you can imagine, there's a, as the... The worshiping community or the Christians as they were becoming, um, there's a significant difference between gathering Sunday evening, having dinner with friends, and whatever the fellowship that would be, to having it be part of a ritual that you do on this on Sunday and that before um, Constantine, Sunday was a work day for people. They didn't have the day off. And so they would be doing this ritual in the morning before they went for a full day of work. So there's something very different about celebrating Eucharist as part of this perhaps very meaningful worship that you would do before you rush off to work than a meal that you could imagine would go on for some time with your friends. So it makes a change in the community. Well, there's church potluck. There's church potluck. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So then as in most things, things changed a lot in the fourth century with um, the rise of Constantine and the establishment of Christianity as the official state religion. Um, on the left, that's an icon of Constantine, and can you guess who's with him? His mother, Helen, who was, who was very significant because Helen encouraged Constantine to build large churches on sites around the Roman Empire that had, significant to the Jesus, had significance in the Jesus story. Um, so if you go to, who's been to Jerusalem, to um, Palestine or Israel? Has anybody... You may have been there. So you go and you see these huge basilicas um, on sites that were, are important in the story that probably at the time of Jesus they were maybe a hut or a, um, other than a temple um, or just a regular building, but now they're these huge basilicas. So she built them and they could, because they could hold the growing numbers of Christians coming to worship, but also the buildings themselves echoed the, um, the secular law court of the day and this kind of pomp and circumstance and kind of triumphalistic theology. Um, and to kind of fit the space as that happens, the, the clergy, who were begin beginning to be a clergy class by then, their garb that they wore and how they conducted themselves began to grow in pomp and circumstance to fill the space. So their stoles began to have the same kind of symbols as the law courts or the, the magistrates in town, and they would process in, and they'd be more and more kind of set apart from the gathered uh, community. And the action became upfront rather than 
the sense that you get in the early writings is this group of people who gather together and there's a president, but they share, there's prayers of the people, there's lots of, there's the kiss, there's the offering, there's lots of mixing among the community. But with the fourth century and beyond, there's a separation between the clergy and um, the, uh, the congregants. And the other thing that changed is people are not necessarily there because they had a, an individual personal conversion experience. So in the early years, the, the, it wasn't super great necessarily to be a Jesus follower. You'd suffer persecution. Um, but then after Constantine, everybody wanted to be a Christian because, I mean, there were definitely still people who had a legitimate conversion experience or heard the story of Jesus and it changed their heart. And there were people there who it was good for their business, it was, good, it was a good marrying prospect for their son or their daughter to join the church. So there was this different sense um, of why you were there. And so because of that, the, the rites, the two primary rituals, so baptism and communion, changed. It used to be that people had a conversion experience and they wanted to be baptized. But now they want to be baptized because that's how you get to the church. So they might not have a conversion experience. They might not be interested in changing their life in the way that the clergy or the leaders talk about how you have to have a life change to be a follower of Jesus. So the leaders of the church, and the same thing with the Eucharist, um, used to be that you talked about, um, you know, you would, you, would, you would have a conversion and you come to Eucharist or communion. So the church leaders were concerned about this because people would take these sacraments and then they'd continue to live their kind of regular, ordinary, non-transformed lives. So the, the rituals began to change so that they were more intense and elaborate. So the rituals themselves were designed to create the emotional experience of, or a cathartic experience that folks mostly would have had in some way before they entered the church. Does that make sense? So baptism became um, this kind of the secret ritual. You weren't told what it was going to be, and then you would kind of enter in, and it was big and mysterious and long, and you wouldn't really get the theological reasoning until after. So it was meant to be, I think about it, I mean, I shouldn't even say this because this is negatively portraying, but I think about it in my, in my college years of some of the fraternity and sorority rites, you know, like you go through and you have this experience, and then it's explained to you later. Um, and the same thing with communion, and partly too, because people wanted to be Christian, but they weren't really sure they wanted to be followers of Christ and all of that, and all that implied, they would delay, so they, they would say, well, I want to be Christian, so um, I'll do the beginning part of the baptism, but I'll delay the actual moment of baptism because that's when you're supposed to have a, live a clean life. So there was this kind of negotiating that people would do around, do I really have to become a follower of Jesus and um, give up my possessions and start loving my enemies and doing all these things that are challenging? Um, so with communion, it made a big impact because um, folks would, they would uh, not want to take communion or delay communion because they didn't want to have to confess or have clean heart before they would. And so they would, people would leave before that moment of the church. They would come to church and then right before communion, they'd be like slip out the door. Well, then the clergy began to realize this. And so they adjusted their theology accordingly. And so they began to say that, well, you don't really have to take communion. You really just need to be in the room when communion is happening because, you know, the priest can do it on your behalf. Or even if you just see the host, the bread, the element, then that in and of itself is if you're seeing the moment when the host becomes the body of Jesus, then you are then you've gotten it. You've gotten the, the benefit of communion. So they began. So over the over the years, over the centuries, there began to be this thing called ocular communion. Has anybody heard about that? So you see these, I wonder if I have a picture. Nope, I don't. Um, you see these icons of uh, two things, of, of, and actually you can see pictures of it, of, of um, ministers with their backs to the congregation, speaking in a language that the congregation didn't speak by this, by this time, holding up the communion, and sometimes there'd even be screens. There'd be a screen, like if I was the minister, I would never be the minister because I'm a woman, but if I was the minister and you all were the congregation, there'd be a screen because it would be so holy that you couldn't, you couldn't look at it. And then at some moment, I would lift up this round wafer, and you would all probably go, ooh, ah, I mean, who knows, and, and then that would be communion. And then also they had this, this process of where they would process the communion elements in the street. Um, so it was very, as you can see, so different than gathering around a table fellowship, remembering um, 
the, the story of Jesus and being in community together. You know, I don't know. Probably. And that cross is uh, the Constantinian cross, and there's probably some reason for that that now I've forgotten. Yeah. And that's a, that actually is a picture of the Basilica in Nazareth that is a um, Basilica of Mary. It's actually beautiful. It has, um, as just an aside, it has mosaics made of um, representations of the Virgin Mary from all the different countries of the world. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite gorgeous. So changes came with the Reformation, and you all had a whole class that Kit taught on the Reformation, so, and I'm not an expert in the Reformation at all, so this is very, very quick. Um, but some really significant changes happened with Martin Luther and the other reformers. And there's, there's lots of variations of the reformers, right? So they didn't have, and part of what they disagreed about was some things around worship. But for the most part, here's some, here's some important things. Mass was in the language of the people, huge. Because it had been in Latin, it wasn't in the language of folks. People didn't, they couldn't read the Bible, and so they were completely dependent on the clergy. Um, and they couldn't even really understand what the clergy was saying. So Mass was in the language of the people. Hymnody began. So Martin Luther was a big person who said that, you know, one of the ways that we experience God, someone said this at the beginning when I asked about worship, is through music, through song, and through songs in the vernacular. So some of our hymns were first sung in bars. They were drinking songs, which is interesting when we get really attached to the solemnity and seriousness of our hymns. It's good for me to remember that, yeah, they were originally drinking songs. Not that we shouldn't sing them, but to hold them with that same level of, they were meant to be the words of the people, that people resonated with. Um, scripture is the norm for worship. So a huge thing uh, coming with the... Um, the, the scripture should be read in the language of the people, and that not only should there be a lot of scripture in worship, like you could read, you should read lessons from the Gospels and the Hebrew Bible, and I mean, the Reformers disagreed about this, but, uh, and the epistles, that how you do worship should be normed by what's in the Bible. And so some of the Reformers disagreed with this, like some thought that only if there was an actual uh, only if the New Testament talked about something as happening were you allowed to do it or have it. And others said, well, as long as there wasn't a prohibition, which is why in some um, Reformation churches you have uh, art and icons and candles and incense, and some you don't, because candles aren't mentioned in the New Testament. And uh, so there was some disagreement with that. But the, the role of Scripture, really important. Um, clergy garb. We changed uh, images and art, talked about that. And, but they still had the same form of worship, pretty much stayed, uh, stayed the same. Okay, so that's the basic form of worship, and we still pretty much have it today. Um, but another way of answering the question, what is worship, is to kind of look at theologically, theological themes, what is it? So some ways of thinking about it. The first one is worship as ritual. So based on the notion that you know humans are hired, hardwired for ritual, we crave ritual and we create it as a way of making meaning out of our lives and as a way of um, having a container to hold things that are too mysterious, too joyful, or too painful to hold. So on Tuesday, we had a prayer vigil for the tragedy that happened in Orlando. And I was thinking about that. One of the things I'm so grateful for about being a member of a church is that we have these rituals that can contain these things that are impossible to hold on our own or even to make sense of in our own minds and to move beyond. And so we gather. So worship is part of that. It creates ritual for making meaning in our lives. Um, and we're formed by ritual. By, we are formed by what we repeatedly do. So can you think of some rituals that we do in worship and how they might form us? As Christians? It's, it's a very sometimes we sit down and sometimes we stand Say more about that. Well, one of the things, uh, unfortunately, um, I've only been to the Roman Catholic 
standing up and sitting down is kind of a, how we are in community together. And, yeah. And, and um, together is, is people to know what to, you know, what to Yeah, yeah. You're shaped by your neighbor. Uh, 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 one thing I really like about is when they have a strong presence in the baseball when you can grow higher to make a mental state, grow to the model in the wrong place, that's what you're supposed to do. That's news. Everybody uh -huh. is saying, oh, no, that poor man. That poor man. So that community of people knowing what to do. Shaping the behavior, yeah, both in worship and hopefully, you know, in some ways out. What other rituals do we do? And what they say about us, yeah, Constance. So basically, as I recall, uh, worship used to be that the uh, clergy person, the priest, pastor, would say in the congregation to join in. Now we have the ritual of a choir, a group mm -hmm. of person leading worship, mm -hmm. as we tell the congregation, okay, you have these people leading worship, just, and they're not presented to you, but they're just saying, come on in, come on in to what's happening. This is, this is the music part of it, then you're going to have the word part of it, but all this goes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things I should, I have it later in my notes, but one of the things I should have put on the Reformation slide that was huge is priesthood of all believers. So that's a huge theological tenet that came with the Reformation and definitely very strong part of our progressive Christian heritage, that it's not just about the person in the clergy garb, that all of us show up and create it together, definitely. And so we have rituals, hopefully, that help to um, kind of communicate that in the song leaders. What other kinds of rituals do we do? Light candles, passing of the peace. So what might that, how might that form us as followers of Jesus? Yeah, Stan. For, how might it, might it form us? How might it shape our, you know, if we are what we repeatedly do, right? So these rituals that we do in worship, ideally they're not just things that happen between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. on a Sunday, but they, they prepare us, they form us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as bearers of God's peace to one another, that part of our role as Christians is to bring that peace, to name it, to wish it, and to offer it to other people, not just in the pews, hopefully, but out in our lives. Same thing with communion, right? We'll talk a little bit about this. We'll get to worship as rehearsal for the kingdom of God. It also gets us to talk to us. Yep, definitely. Yep, yep. Collect money. Collect money, yep, absolutely. Yep, this, well, yeah, and that, that, that sense that we are... Um, that what we have doesn't belong to us. It doesn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I didn't create it. It's a gift and that I give it back into the community and into God. Yeah. And then the offering includes the bread and the wine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep, yep, those are part of the gifts. Yeah. Any idea what the offering would be for what we're going to do with it? Well, when I read from the second from John, uh, Justin Martyr in the second century, I mean, I was, it, I was amazed because I had that same question and I was like, oh, there it is. The, the wealthy. So you can take that to whatever it is you think. <laughs> um, the wealthy would contribute, and they would give it to the president uh, to, to distribute as to, the, to those in need. Yeah, so I think from, from the very beginning. We read scripture. We read scripture. Scripture always makes a cohesiveness. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yep, yep. And in the UCC, we, we create each congregation has has their own has their own rituals. Okay, another one is worship. Worship as divine revelation or encounter with God. So here's a split in the kind of the Reformed tradition. So the Calvin or the Reformed traditions talked about God's real presence um, is revealed in the reading and interpretation of Scripture, whereas Quakers or Charismatics, that part of the tradition, would say that God's real presence is experienced through the spirit moving in the congregation. And a few weeks ago, I did a class here about uh, progressive, emergent, and convergent Christianity. Some of you were there. We talked about the bringing together that part of the move in progressive Christianity right now is to bring those, those pieces back together. You know, that, we, that God is revealed, we experience, we encounter God through our brains and through really thinking through scripture, but also through the movement of the spirit in our bodies. Um, how, how if, if anybody feels like sharing, how do you particularly, if you do, find God revealed to you through in worship or during worship? 
communion, mm -hmm. prayer, prayer. Tears. tears, emotion, yeah, uh, music. the music, the sermons, the sermons. yeah, The sensory, the sensory nature of it, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. And I would say uh, the lens of the person delivering the sermon. Uh-huh, okay. And the greeting each other. Mm -hmm. the, the, the yeah. gathered body together. Mm -hmm. I often see it in the kids. Yeah, their joy of being together and running down the aisle. Yeah, okay. Another theme, the way we can think about worship as uh, worship as a response to God. So this is huge for the congregational and reform tradition. So the antecedents that became the United Church of Christ, the reform part of that branch, this was the primary place that, that those folks live. And you can see it all through our book of worship, that worship is a response to God. We love because God first loved us. That what we're doing when we gather together is responding in praise and lament in thanksgiving to who God is in the world. Um, and what that means uh, for us in a progressive Christian context is if worship is a response to God, our response to God, then the culturally and uh, contextually specific pieces of us, like who we are in the pews and how that shows up in worship, is not only appropriate, but it's necessary. Does that make sense? So we can't, we don't respond in the same way as another gathered community would respond, or we don't respond in the same way as a community 200 years ago would respond. That part of our responsibility is to be able to think, well, how would we in our authentic selves, as diverse as we are, respond to God? And so we figure that out together because each of us are different. And so some of us, if musically is how we encounter God and we want to respond to God in that way, some of us choose a certain kind of music, others choose a different kind of music. Same with um, silence, no silence, lots of art, no art. You know, we work that out together. But that's faithful. That's part of what we're called to do in our um, coming together as a worshiping community. Exactly. 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 Okay. Okay. Worship is relationship. So the quote from uh, our book of worship is, Worship should grow relationships and genuine, genuine encounters with God and with each other. So what is it in worship um, do you think would grow? Some of the stuff we may have already said, it might be the same answer. Grows relationship between each other or between us and God. Pass in peace. experience. Shared experiences. So I was thinking, if, if you're in worship this morning, the te testimony, you know, that Julie gave this week and Rowan gave last week. Different, uh, different gifts, different talents, mm -hmm. different personalities. Mm -hmm. I can't say that well. I'm not going to be doing it solo, mm -hmm. but I should be doing mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. Yep, that there's a way that our spirit opens up when other people are singing or praying, yeah. And this might be, I mean, maybe this is a harder question or not to answer. If you can think about the ways that what we do in worship or what you experience in worship helps you to understand um, or experience God desiring to be in relationship with you. And I know that language works for some folks and doesn't for others. I thought Phil preached beautifully about that this morning, that we can have a very non-theistic understanding of God with as lack of images as possible for as wide a view as possible and yet sometimes there's this desire to just have this intimate relationship with someone who knows us. So I'm wondering if there's, there's moments or ways that our worship helps you to know that that presence that we call God wants to be in relationship with you. Yes, Dan? Uh, I understand that uh, Natalie Uh, 
try to intentionally manipulate situations to create that, but we know that that happens. I was just gonna say, actually, that one of the privileges of sitting, particularly when we're in the sanctuary, is you know we can see out, and every week I'll look out and I'll be like, oh, that person's weeping. And you know, sometimes I'll, it'll be obvious why, but oftentimes it's not. And you know, for me, or, the, or often the laughing, you know, that we have that happen almost every week in our service, like the, something that makes us belly laugh and something that makes us cry. And um, I do think that that's, there's something in that that's speaking beyond our, just our cognitive selves to, to our hearts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Susan. I, I find that, I mean, I'm not sure because I have to do it with the choir, there are some, some days I think I'm going to like to sit in, mm-hmm. but I come, and I always find something Yeah, I was just going to say that a lot of times when I say this, you know, worship as relationship or how is it that God's seeking to be in relationship with you, people talk about that. Like, oh my gosh, that sermon. How did you know that sermon was right for me? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, yeah. that wasn't me. That's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. And the same thing with the scripture or something that someone might say in an offhand way. I mean, for me, that's, that's the presence of the Spirit. And the thing, too, about the... Um, I don't know, four or six of us who are often up there, sometimes eight of us who are holding the worship space, we talk about it and we plan it together loosely. But it's not like we say, oh, here's exactly what I'm going to say or here's what I'm going to do in my opening prayer. And, but there's a way in which, um, not always, <laughs> but it holds together. And, you know, I think that that's, there is a spirit that happens. And I think people, um, again, not all the time, but I think most folks feel that in some way. Um, and I would say that's the spirit of God making a connection with us. Not everyone would would use that frame, but that's a frame that works for me. Yeah. Uh, speaking to Stan's point, uh, there are the two testimonies that we heard. The room gets very quiet. Everybody is focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and we'll experience that this summer, and we can see how that is. Yeah, see, it's, it's, you know, it elicits... Uh, a heart connection with each other too and that's another thing that worship does is build our build us as the body of christ okay the last one and these themes from that we've stuck has is worship as rehearsal and what she means by that is worship as rehearsal for the kingdom of god that we're being formed to be christ's disciples in the world word at world and trans i would say transformed um, into becoming more and more uh in the way of in the way of Jesus, in the way of um, the Spirit. Um, can you think of examples how this is true? Yep. Even if you don't like them very much. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Bernice. Sure, yeah. So, like, um, if we think about that, um, that Jesus would talk about the kingdom of God, that's what he talked about more than anything else, and not as a, or not only as a far off kingdom after this body this life is over but as something that we can experience right now and and that god desires for us you know liberty and freedom and joy and peace and safety and enough for all that what we do in worship rehearses that um, so that we are ready we're prepared we're formed to go out into the world and do that so one of the ways i think about that actually martin luther king jr has this had this saying i'm not going to get it exactly right where he says that um he prayed that we would become mal- maladjusted to injustice so that when we, we just get so maladjusted to it, so when we experience in the world, we just, it's like something that doesn't fit or it's scratchy or it's irritating. We just can't not 
work to change it. And I think that's, that's partly what worship does. It makes us maladjusted to the culture as it is. So every time we come together and say that this table is an open table and there's enough for all, and it doesn't matter what kind of person you are or um, what's, uh, what you have done or even what you will do, what matters is that there's a place for you and that you can come and receive grace, that that, that has implications in the world in terms of how we live with each other. And so the idea is the more we come together and do that, then when we go out into the world and see that, oh, not everybody has a place at the table, that that feels wrong in our bodies. Like, it, it's, we're maladjusted to that. And the same thing with um, loving our enemies, passing the peace, um, all, of, all, of those, all of those pieces that we become enculturated into um, the world that God desires for us. Does that make sense? That that's, that's partly what worship is designed to do, yeah. I almost say that worship is a reminder. Okay. It's setting up how we should mm-hmm. behave. Mm-hmm. Jesus says the model of mm-hmm. behavior. So we, we have the idea, which is in a sense what mm-hmm. you're saying about the model of the king. Mm-hmm. So at least we're striving yeah. for a little while, and maybe it carries over for a day. Mm-hmm. And it's a reminder. An exercise. Yeah, exercising. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exercising those muscles, reminding ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And not and definitely those pieces around what we should do in the world and the justice piece. And also the other piece that we just talked about, right? The how beloved we are. Because I think one of the risks in a progressive community like ours is we can talk so much about how much work there is to do in the world, which is true, that we can I can get to the place where I feel like my faith is just about working harder in the world. And there is work to do in the world. There is, there is definitely injustice that needs to be addressed. And part of our job is to also rest in the fact that we're beloved creations of God and to experience the joy of that. And so hopefully worship is doing both those things, is filling us up to, to be able to send us out, you know, not like martyrs and roll up our sleeves and there's hard work to do, but with so much joy and love that we want to freely use our gifts in the world. Yeah. Right. Right. So if we come every week and hear about loving our enemies, it makes it much harder for us to go out and talk about how we should bomb them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The problem with rehearsal as a word is, I mean, any of these in isolation are, you know, without all the others would be problematic, right? So the problem with rehearsal is it has this sense that it's not real, that it's practice. And I actually think what we do in worship in and of itself in those 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half, depending, is, is real. Uh, it actually has its own validity to it. Worship yeah, spiritual practice for sure. Yeah, Susan. I remember you overheard a neighbor saying to another neighbor, he is a practicing Christian. Uh-huh. Now, that would be a little discussing what did that mean mm-hmm. and whether it meant he went to church or whether he didn't act like a Christian, but that mm-hmm. in the outside world just going to church, people identify as a practicing Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's actually a good question for another day. What does it mean to be a practicing Christian? It's a good question. Okay, so are there any of these that particularly resonate with you or, um, or anything else that you would add that's not on that list that you would add? Well, they all come together. Yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, especially in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're almost done. So... Progressive Christian worship, this is just my own, how I put this together. When I was thinking about this, like what does it mean for a progressive Christian worship? What would I say about that? Definitely priesthood of all believers is the work of the people. So the word liturgy literally means work of the people. And um, it comes from the Greek word. And the Greek word, uh, I can't quite pronounce it, it sounds very similar to liturgy, 
meant a public work, a work in, in the community that was for the use by the public. So it meant like a, the, the works that would go into creating a public, a park or a resource center or things like that. And so for us, liturgy means work of the people. And so definitely in a progressive Christian worship, it's not, you, you have to show up. That's part of our responsibilities, but not enough just to show up and be a passive receptor. It's not worship. I often say worship is not a spectator sport. Yeah. Um, that we're all that we're all required to. Some of us are up front, but all of us who are there are thinking, are praying, are being open, being willing to be challenged, um, being willing to take that out, and being willing to push back. You know, to be engaged. Um, it takes all of us to do that. Um, inclusive. So inclusive language is a huge section in the book of worship. It's really interesting the way they talk about inclusive language and how important that's been in the United Church of Christ for sure in terms of opening up people to have a relationship with God. If you, you all know this, but if you only talk about God in one particular gender or one particular way or in one particular relation, only up there, right? Never, never in here or in here or even below then it, it limits our way of understanding how to be in relationship with what we call God. So an inclusiveness is really important, not, not just in language, but in music, in body styles, in types of worship. Um, Molly has this great phrase, you'll probably hear her say it a lot, she has a 75% rule, that in a really well-functioning, progressive Christian worshiping community, you're happy about what you like, what's happening about 75% of the time. Because the other 25% of the time, what's happening isn't to your taste, but you know it's to the taste of the person down the pew, and you love them, and you want them to be part of your community. So you're happy that we have what's happening right that moment, even if it's not the thing that you like. You're like, okay, this person really needs and wants that, so I'm, I'm glad that we're doing it. And then next week, or 10 minutes from now, there'll be something that I like. So it's, the goal is not 100% satisfaction. That's, not, that's too homogenous of a community, right? We'd all be exactly the same. But in a full, functioning, inclusive, diverse community, 75% rule, I love that. So scripture is central. It's interpreted contextually, communally, and expansively. So what I mean by that is that, we, that we, um, it's important as part of every time we gather together, and that, but we don't just take it at face value, that we're interpreting it based on our own context, and in community with each other. So even though this, the preacher might be preaching about it, the people who are listening are doing their own work. What do I think about that? Huh, I wonder what it says before and after that text. They're talking to each other about it. They're pushing back against um, interpretations that don't sit well with them, and they're willing to, to be pushed in return. Music, art, and body, I talked about that. Covenantal. So covenant is huge. I'm sure um, Kit talked about this when she did the United Church of Christ class. So we're a covenantal community. It's not a contract, but we agree to be in relationship with each other, even when, especially when we disappoint each other, which we will. <laughs> um, that, we, that we commit to staying in relationship with each other and doing the work to figure that out. And again, back to the 75% rule. And then um, we, uh, Kit told me this phrase the other day, and I, she told me where she got it, but I can't remember where it was. I just love it. Judgment-free accountability. That part of why, somebody said this earlier, that part of why we come to worship is to be reminded of who we are and who we want to be in the world. And that's part of what we offer to each other and without judgment. So it's not like there's some moral high bar. It's like, oh, well... Too bad for you that you didn't meet it this week. But it's this sense of, yeah, we're called to be our best and most authentic selves in knowing that we can't always do that. And so both holding both things. But partly why we come to worship is to be reminded of our best and most authentic selves. Um, and I think judgment-free accountability is what we get from God, too, right? Like this, this uh, nudging, this lure to bring our gifts into the world and complete love and acceptance and grace when we just can't. So I think that that's the kind of community we should be and are. I think we are in that way too. So um, we have a few more minutes. Thoughts, questions? Yeah. Ready to work. So showing up on time, ready to worship. 
Exactly. Yep. On time, you know, 902. <laughs> but definitely ready. Yeah, Bob. My Yeah, that you're welcome however and whoever and wherever you are. Yep. And then usually we don't leave in the same way we came in. Yep, something, something happens. Not always, doesn't always feel super pleasant, but something happens. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm aware this reflects my opinion, and a lot of people disagree with me, but as a musician, when I play and I'm playing with the church, it's not a performance. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. service. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. To applause, yeah. You know, there's a lot, that's such an interesting thing. I have lots of conversations with folks about this. Definitely, and that makes sense. And for some folks, and in some traditions, applause is not, in, this, in the context of worship, not so much in the same way as a performance that you would go to at Zellerbach Hall, but as a way of expressing joy in the spirit. It's a way of moving the body to say, yes, we're with you. But yeah, it makes, I get that, because our culture is so, you know, sage on the stage kind of thing. And, and yeah. Yep. yep, exactly. It's fun. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, we have two more reclaim, reclaim classes. We're, this is week 14. I can't believe it. You all have hung in there so amazingly well through this series. Um, so next week, uh, uh, Ben Bigney, who's a young adult in our congregation who just got ordained, actually, and I will do, will be um, talking about prayer and meditation. And I invited Ben to help me because he, in addition to being a Christian and um, a practicing Christian, he also has a really strong and developed um, meditation practice that uh, primarily comes through a Buddhist tradition. So we'll be looking at prayer and meditation from the Christian perspective, but so many times folks say, well, how is that different from... You know, Buddhist meditation, especially in this area in the East Bay. So it'll be fun to do that class with Ben and have you all get to know him if you don't yet because he's such a dear. Um, and then the last class, Kit Novotny will be teaching on faith practices. And so we'll be looking at um, a bajillion different things about the practices of our faith. Um, and then at some point, we'll be, the adult ed committee will be looking for feedback around how you liked the Reclaim series you know, how you'd want to change it, what questions you still have, just any kind of feedback. So Charles Taylor would be the person or me or, um, uh, yeah, Debbie. No, no. So, so we'll figure out a way to do that. We haven't really talked about it yet whether there'll be a survey or, I don't know, more, more will be revealed. 